Today we will begin to look at the final words of the Apostle Paul in his letter to the church at Rome, to this book of Romans that we have been studying through for the last few years. And in our study, uh, what we have discovered time after time is that Paul, in this most carefully written of all of his letters, emphasizes the grace of God in the gospel. He expounds the gospel of Jesus Christ more fully, more carefully in this letter than in any of his others. And what he emphasizes in those expositions that we've worked our way through is that God reveals his grace in salvation to all who trust Jesus. That is, that God saves sinners. He forgives sinners. He welcomes sinners. He accepts sinners, not on the basis of what we have done, not on the basis of our performance or who we are, but he accepts all who trust in Christ on the basis of who Jesus is. And what Jesus has done. It is by his grace that anyone is ever reconciled to God. The scripture teaches very clearly from Old Testament to New Testament. And is highlighted again in this book of Romans. That everybody has fallen away from God. And everybody as a result has sinned against him. As Paul puts it in chapter 3, verse 23 of this letter, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And as he says in that same chapter, there's no one righteous, none righteous. No, not one. Nobody seeks for God. And as he says early in chapter 1, because of that, because of our sin, the universality of sin, The wrath of God is now being revealed against all unrighteousness. All the ungodliness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. But though it is true we have all sinned, though it is true that God's wrath is being revealed from heaven against sin in this world, God did not leave us in a state of sin and unrighteousness with no hope. Rather, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the world for us. As he says in chapter 5 of this letter, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we've now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved from the wrath of God by him. The salvation that Jesus accomplished by his life and his death and his resurrection is received not by doing anything. It's received by trusting. It's received by faith, by believing. As Paul puts it in Romans 3, 28, For we hold that no one is justified by faith apart from, we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. It's the only way. No one will ever be justified by their own works, but only through faith apart from works. So forgiveness from God, forgiveness of your sins, justification in God's courtroom where he declares you righteous is received by faith through the grace that God shows us in Jesus Christ. It cannot be earned. It can only be received by faith. Roman explains this in many ways and shows us how this good news, this gospel that's provided for us is completely on the basis of God's kindness, mercy, and grace And it changes every aspect of our lives. God's grace is enough to strengthen us day by day. It's enough to give us hope. It's enough to encourage us, no matter what we might experience. So if you want this life, you want new life in Christ, trust Him. Believe Him. 
Receive Him. There's nothing for you to do. Just take God at His word. And as Christ is set before you from the word of God, humble yourself and confess your need of Him. Confess your sin against Him and trust Him. We who have trusted Jesus Christ as Lord, we're brothers and sisters. We're in the family of God and it would please us greatly if you who have not yet trusted Christ would do so today, that you might together with us begin to follow him as we grow together in him. Brothers and sisters, what the book of Romans teaches us is that we have an all encompassing gospel that comes to us by grace alone is received by faith alone in Christ alone so that the glory for the salvation this gospel gives us might redound to God alone. Today, we start looking at the final verses of this letter. And as we do so, we'll see that Paul wraps up the whole letter by sending greetings from people who are with him as he writes, as well as expressing glory to God. Our text is Romans chapter 16, Romans 16, beginning in verse 21. And we'll go down through verse 27, Romans 16, 21 through 27. If you use one of the Bibles provided, you'll find it on page 951, 951. I encourage you to get a copy of the scripture in front of you and follow along as I read. You'll see in verses 21 through 23, the greetings that are extended. And then you'll find in verses 25 through 27, the expression of glory or praise to God on which Paul ends this letter. So today, we're going to look at the greetings, we're going to introduce these expressions of glory, then God willing, next week we'll come back and spend more time finishing up our study of this letter by looking more carefully at that closing doxology. But follow along as I read Romans 16, beginning in verse 21, down through verse 27. (coughs) Excuse me. Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you. So do Lucius and Jason and Sosipater, my kinsmen. Tertius, I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, who is host to me and to the whole church, greets you. Erastus, the city treasurer, and our brother Quartus greet you. Now to him who is able to strengthen you, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed, through the prophetic writings, has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, before we start looking at these verses, I want to call your attention to verse 24. So take a look at that verse. If you're using the English Standard Version, it's not there, except in the footnote. And there's a reason for that, and I want to try to explain that reason to you to allay any kind of concerns that you might have. If you're using the New American Standard or New King James or King James, you will find that verse there, and it reads like this, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. The reason the English Standard Version and other modern translations have relegated this to a footnote is because there's a serious question about whether or not Paul actually wrote these words in this particular place. That's a textual question. It's a question about the authenticity of these words in this place. And what it means is that most scholars who study textual issues of the Greek New Testament have concluded from the oldest manuscripts and the most reliable manuscripts that this appears to be a gloss. Now, it's certainly true, everything that that verse that is in the footnote of the ESV says, it's true. And if you'll look at verse 20 at the very end, it's almost word for word identical to what Paul did right there. And the assumption is that some of those early copyists who were taking the copies of the scriptures that we had available before there was any kind of automatic way to copy them, the eyes went back to verse 20 at the end and they wrote down almost identically what was there in this, what is for us, or would have been verse 24. 
Now, again, that doesn't at all speak against the authority of what we have in our Bibles. It doesn't speak against the inspiration of what we have in our Bibles. It is a question of whether or not Paul actually wrote those words at that particular place in our Bibles. So do not let the fact that it's relegated to a footnote in any way raise questions in your minds about the inspiration or the authority of God's word. In verses 21 through 23, Paul gives us greetings from eight fellow workers who were with him when he writes this letter. If you recall in verses 1 through 16 of this chapter, this last chapter, we saw Paul give greetings to gospel workers who were in Rome. From verse 3 through verse 16, he names several different people that he knew or knew about in the church at Rome, and he sends greetings to them. You may recall... When Paul wrote this letter, he was in the town of Corinth where he had labored for 18 months seeing a church of Jesus Christ established there. And now then, he extends greetings from some of his fellow workers, some of his gospel partners who were there with him in Corinth as they want to add their greetings with Paul to the church at Rome. Let's briefly consider these fellow gospel partners who are with him that want to greet those who will receive this letter. The first person that Paul mentions is the closest companion that he had as an apostle. It's Timothy. You see his name begins in verse 21. Timothy joined Paul on his second missionary journey when Paul went through the town of Lystra. You can read about this in Acts chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. We learn there that Timothy's mother was a Jewish Christian, but his father was a Greek. And because of that, Timothy had never been circumcised, but Paul was taking him on a mission where they were going to be preaching to both Jews and Gentiles, so Paul had him circumcised so that there would not be any offense by the people to whom they were carrying the gospel. Timothy was Paul's good friend. He was a very trusted worker with Paul in the gospel. Earlier, before the letter that he wrote to the Romans, Paul wrote to the church at Philippi and he commended Timothy specifically in chapter 2, verses 20 and 21 of that letter. Listen to Philippians 2, 20 and 21. Speaking of Timothy, he says, I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare, for they all seek their own interests not those of Jesus Christ. Paul had a lot of associates, but he says Timothy's in a class by himself. He's above the rest because he doesn't seek his own concerns. He's always seeking the welfare of others. Paul also wrote two letters to Timothy in our New Testament. And in those letters, he's encouraging him to carry on the work that must be continued after Paul's death. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2, he calls Timothy my true child in the faith. At the opening of 2 Timothy, he calls him my beloved child. Timothy is a wonderful example of the enabling grace of God working in a person so that he can become useful in Christ's kingdom. How much do you know about Timothy? We know he was Paul's associate. We know he was a very close associate of Paul. But do you know much about his background? The New Testament gives us a little bit of insight into his background. Enough to know that Timothy didn't have many advantages growing up. Not only was his father a Gentile, but his father was evidently an unbeliever. In 2 Timothy 1 verse 5, Paul speaks about the faith of Timothy's grandmother, a woman named Lois, and his mother, who was named Eunice. But he says nothing about his father, which means that his father may have been dead. Or maybe he was absent. Maybe he left Timothy and his mother. The best that we could surmise is that he was in the home but he remained an unbeliever. 
His father did not help him spiritually. So in that sense, as Timothy started his life as a Christian, he did not have the advantage of a godly father pouring into him. Paul calls Timothy's faith, nevertheless, sincere in 2 Timothy 1.5. Sincere. That is, Timothy's faith was real, and when pressed, when tried, it proved itself to be genuine. Unlike some of the other associates of Paul, like Demas, who professed faith in Christ, but who, we're told, was in love with the present world and departed, deserted Paul. Timothy proved faithful over time. He proved himself to be invaluable to Paul's work in advancing the gospel throughout the Roman Empire. Now, there's some of you here that can identify with Timothy. You didn't have many spiritual advantages in your background. Maybe you didn't grow up in a home where Christ was known and honored, and you didn't have a parent or parents who poured into you and and tried to nurture you in the ways of Christ, the way that you might wish for. You should take heart. Though you may not have had all of the advantages of home life, and you may not have them now in the way that you could wish for, God's grace can enable you to trust him faithfully and sincerely, just as Timothy did. Your faith can be as sincere as his was. And there are mothers here who are in the same situation that Eunice found herself in in you don't have a a godly husband in your life to help you there are grandmothers here who like Lois wants to pour into children Lois's her Lois's grandchild you want to impact them and you don't have all of the advantages that you could wish for in the home well listen if you are a a mother who's trying to raise a child without the advantage of a godly Husband, if you're a grandmother who doesn't have all the access you would like to have, all the opportunities you'd like to have, take heart and learn from his grandmother, Lois, and his mother, Eunice, and do what you can for your child and your grandchild, knowing that you can, with limited opportunities, help them to grow wise in the scriptures that are able to bring them to faith in Jesus Christ. You can do that. And under the blessing of God, your child, your grandchild, can come to a sincere faith in Christ, just like Timothy did. After Timothy, Paul mentions Lucius and Jason and Sosipater. He calls them my kinsmen, that is, his fellow Jews in verse 21. Lucius could be associated with the Lucius that is mentioned in the church at Syrian Antioch, in Acts chapter 13, verse 1. But we can't be sure of that. The same thing's true of Jason. He could be that brother in the church at Thessalonica that took a beating for Paul in Acts chapter 17, verses 5 through 9, but we can't be certain. So Sipater could be a variation of Sopater, the Berean mentioned in Acts chapter 20 and verse 1. But we don't know anything else about him. You'll see in verse 22 that Tertius says, I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you. Who was Tertius? Well, he was Paul's amanuensis. He was his secretary. He took dictation from the Apostle Paul and wrote down what Paul said. And you'll notice the language. He says, I, Tertius, greet you. He's writing it himself. Employing somebody to write what you dictated was not uncommon in the ancient Greek and Roman world. It certainly was not uncommon for Paul because he indicates to us in some of his other letters that he takes the pen in hand at the end and signs off the last part of those letters. We see this like in Galatians 6, 11. I, Paul, write with my own hand. He says something similar in 2 Thessalonians 3, 17, 1 Corinthians 16, 21, and Colossians 4, 18. Tertius, who literally wrote the letter to the church at Rome, he did so taking down dictation from the Apostle Paul. He sends his greetings. 
as does Gaius. Paul identifies him who is a host to me and to the whole church. He almost certainly is the Gaius that is mentioned in 1 Corinthians 1.14 when Paul's trying to recount who it was he baptized in Corinth. Well, this is one of them. And he was a hospitable Christian in Corinth. Paul's staying in his home and his hospitality overflowed to the whole church in Corinth. Erastus is mentioned in verse 23. He's the city treasurer. And then along with him is Quartus, our brother. Uh, there's been an inscription found in an ancient uh, site of the city of Corinth that has the name Aras- Erastus inscribed on it. And some people associate that with this Erastus. It may be true, but that Erastus was a city commissioner in Corinth. That's not what this Erastus is identified as being, though he did obviously work for the city. Quartus is a man about whom we know nothing other than Paul just calls him my brother. So once again, these names, like those in verses 3 through 16, remind us that the work of the gospel is best carried out by partners. I mean, think about this for a moment. Paul was a very capable man. He was gifted by God. He was called and set apart and anointed to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. He wrote more books in the New Testament than anybody else. But Paul did not try to live the Christian life alone. And he didn't try to carry out the mission that had been entrusted to him alone. And brothers and sisters, neither should we. The life that you've been called to as a follower of Christ is intended to be lived together with others who, like you, are committed to following Jesus Christ. The work of the gospel is best advanced with gospel partners. The whole church is a body of believers. We become a family. We're faith related to one another. And as such, in the family of a church, we have promised to live together in ways that are honest and helpful. In order to develop the kind of gospel relationships that will strengthen you as you follow Christ, you must be willing to know people and to be known by people. That is, you must be willing to open your life to other believers and allow them to open up their lives to you. What that means is you can't be content to have simply antiseptic relationships. You know what that is. That's the relationships that never go any deeper than how are you doing? Fine. Great. How are you doing? Fine. Great. And you think, oh, wouldn't that wonderful Christian fellowship? Now, there's a place for those kinds of greetings, times and settings. But if that is all that you know in your relationships in the church, then you are cutting yourself off from what God has provided for you and the way God calls you to live the Christian life. If you live like that, you don't ever have to think about being transparent. And you certainly don't have to think about what it might mean to be vulnerable to another brother or sister by opening up to him or her your doubts, your fears, your sorrows, your questions, your needs, heartaches, your shame. You just go through life living in your own little circle, being quick to say fine when you're asked and hoping that that's all everybody else will say to you as well. Brothers and sisters, listen to what the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. He's pleading with them as an apostle whose heart is heavy. He says in verse 11 of 2 Corinthians 6, We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You're not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. In return, I speak as to children. Widen your hearts also. You see what Paul's saying? He says, look, I've opened up my life to you. I haven't just tried to relate to you at arm's distance. I haven't tried to have just antiseptic relationships with you. 
My heart has been opened. And I'm pleading with you to open your heart to me. If you're going to advance in your spiritual life, if you are going to fulfill the mission God's given to you, whether that mission is raising little ones in your home or representing Christ on the job, at the work site or at school, or finishing your race strong in the latter years of your life, or using your singleness in effective ways for the cause of Christ, you're going to need the partnership of brothers and sisters who will help you along the way. Which means you're going to have to be willing to commit to spend the time necessary and the energy necessary to know and to be known. Now, that doesn't mean that you just live your life out there with no filters. Not what Paul's talking about. What he's talking about is being willing to engage in some meaningful relationships that become deepened as they are intentionally grounded in the gospel so that you can live together wholeheartedly following Christ. Well, these closing words of the letter contain not only those greetings from Paul's fellow workers, but in verses 25 through 27, we also see that they contain a closing expression of praise to God. Let's look at those verses in verse 25. Let me just read them to you again. Verses 25, 26 and 27. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. According to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God, be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. These verses are a doxology, a doxology. That is, they are an expression of praise to God. The word doxology is a compound word that comes from praise or or, or God, praise and a word. So it's a a word of praise and it's directed toward God. There are several doxologies in the New Testament. We heard one from the book of Psalms this morning and the Psalms are filled with doxologies as well. But listen to how Paul puts a doxology in 1 Timothy 1.17. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And then he does it in the middle of his letter to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ, in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. We see it also in the opening of the book of Revelation in verse five and six of chapter one to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom priests to his God and father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. In fact, we've seen a doxology already in this letter. If you recall, at the end of the doctrinal section of the letter, chapter 11, beginning in verse 33 through 36, Paul also there breaks out into a doxology. But now, as he's wrapping up the letter and he's thinking about things that he's written, we'll look at that more carefully next time, Paul cannot help but offer up praise to this God. Now, the doxology we find here closing the letter can be divided into two parts. The first is in verses 25 and 26, and the latter is in verse 27. If you look at those verses you can see that if we just simply take the basic statement that Paul makes and set set aside for the moment all the qualifying clauses that he adds to that statement, you'll see this is what Paul is saying. Look at verse 25. He says this, Now to him who is able to strengthen you, and then go down to verse 27, to the only wise God be glory. That is the essence of this doxology. I want us to look at these two parts, this essence today, and then God willing, next week we'll come and look at all the different ways that Paul qualifies it to give us the full orbed doxology. In verse 25, he offers up glory to God who can give you strength. Glory to him who is able to strengthen you. 
that word strengthen, to strengthen. It's a word that means to make something or someone secure, to establish something, to establish someone. In fact, there are many translations that use the word establish instead of strengthen. One lexicon has defined it like this, to cause someone to become stronger in the sense of more firm and unchanging in attitude or belief, to strengthen, to make more firm. And Paul is saying praise to God because he's able to do that. He has the resources to do that. The means of making his people stable. Making his people strong. Praise God for being able to give you strength. Do you remember the conversation that Jesus had with Peter? In the upper room the night that he was betrayed before he was arrested early that next morning, began to be put on trial. Remember what he said to Peter? In Luke chapter 22, we, we have a, a record of part of that conversation. In verse 31, this is what Jesus said to Simon Peter. He calls him Simon, Simon. And he says, Behold, Satan has demanded to have you, that he might sift you as wheat. I mean, what an image. The devil wants you. He wants to shake you. He wants to try to demonstrate that there's nothing there. That you'll fall to pieces and you won't survive the trial. But Jesus goes on in verse 32. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers strengthen your brothers it's the same root word that paul uses in this doxology at the end of romans to say that we should praise god who is able to strengthen us have you ever imagined what it must have been like for peter during that time when satan was sifted him we read about it in luke and mark other gospels john where when Jesus was arrested, he was taken into the court of the high priest's house. And and Jesus had told Peter, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And you remember what Peter said? He said, oh, Lord, look, I am willing to not only be arrested with you, I'm willing to die with you. And now then the scene is Jesus has been arrested. He's appearing before the high priest and Somebody comes to Peter and says, aren't you one of his disciples? Peter says, no, I don't know him. And a little slave girl says, but you sound like a Galilean. Aren't you one of them? No, I don't know him. And somebody else asks, well, I think you are one of his disciples. And he curses. I don't know the man. Then the rooster crows. And Luke, tells us that at that moment, Peter, who's hanging back, he can see into the courtyard. Jesus turns and their eyes meet. And Luke says, Peter went out and he wept bitterly. What must have been going on in his mind? Despite all of his boasting, despite all of his confidence, He failed, and he failed miserably. And he failed not because he didn't love Jesus. He did love Jesus. But in the time of testing, he came up short. Peter must have thought that his usefulness in Christ's kingdom was over. He blew it. What hope can there be for someone who has failed like that? In that moment, Peter was weak. He was unstable. As stable as water. Yet Jesus, when predicting his fall, said to him, after you have returned, after you've repented, after you've been renewed, after your devotion to Christ has been rekindled, strengthen your brothers. How could somebody who's so 
unstable, so weak, ever be used to strengthen others? How does that happen? Only by the grace of the God who is able to strengthen you. And that's what happened to Peter. God came to him. He didn't leave him in his weakness. He came to him. He renewed him. He revived him. And in his repentance and in his faith, Peter did go on to help strengthen other believers. Brothers and sisters, have you ever been where Peter was? Has Satan come to sift you and you have to look back and say, I failed miserably. It might be that you're being sifted right now. And you're failing right now. And all that you can let yourself hope for is that maybe nobody will notice. And maybe you'll be able to keep your head down and just kind of make it to the end. We should remember what Jesus told the Apostle Paul. When Paul felt himself being tormented by a messenger from the devil. And he begged God to take it away from him. He prayed specifically. And you remember what God said? No. No, I won't change your circumstances. But the Lord Jesus did say this to him on that occasion. My grace is sufficient for you. Because my power is made perfect in your weakness. What an encouraging thought that is for weak, unstable believers. Don't you think, don't you ever think that your weakness somehow disqualifies you for doing what God has called you to do, for being what God's called you to be? Why? Because your weakness is like a set table. For God to display the sufficiency of His grace. To manifest His perfect power in taking somebody who's unstable and weak and making them strong and renewing them and helping them to carry out the mission that He has placed upon your life. So trust this God for His grace and give glory to the God who is able to strengthen you. The second part of this doxology is also very relevant for us. As Paul puts it in verse 27 right at the beginning, we're to give glory to the only wise God. As we think about the supremacy and the infinity of God, we, of course, have to conclude that all of His attributes are supreme. All of His attributes are infinite. So, of course, He would be, in that sense, the only wise God. He's the only God Therefore alone, he's worthy to be praised. But more than that, as we think about the ways of God described in this letter that Paul has written to the church at Rome, we must similarly concur to give glory to the only wise God. As the holy God, he saves sinners and he does it in a way that does not detract from his holiness. Have you ever stopped to consider this? That When sin came into the world from a human vantage point, a reasonable vantage point, it created a cosmic dilemma. Because God created those sinners, he created them upright without sin, and they chose sin, and they fell into rebellion against God, and now there's this chasm between the holy God and his now sinful image bearers. And here's the dilemma. How can this holy, righteous God receive sinful image bearers back into his good graces? How can he receive them into his family? How can he be reconciled to them without compromising his holiness? Without lowering his standard of righteousness? Because he required of them perfect righteousness and they've squandered that. They will never be able to provide him With perfect righteousness. What a dilemma. And yet we see in the gospel. 
that God solved that dilemma by sending His Son in the person of Jesus Christ to do everything necessary that His image bearers are required to do and cannot do in order to provide a way of acceptance with God that does not impugn the righteousness or the holiness of God. Listen to the way Paul explains this in chapter 3 of this letter of Romans. In verse 23 through 26, and what's a part of perhaps the definitely the most important paragraph in Romans, and, and maybe the most important paragraph in the whole Bible, listen to what Paul says. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This, is to show, this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he'd passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Do you, you see what Paul's saying? Here's how the dilemma was solved. Because there's an open question mark, an unanswered question that hangs over the righteousness and holiness of God throughout all of Old Testament history. Because this God who's righteous and holy has said, the soul that sins must surely die. The only just payment for sin is eternal damnation under the wrath of God. And yet we read about people in the Old Testament whom God received to Himself, made His children accepted. So, how did Moses get accepted by God without God somehow fudging and lowering His standards or winking at sin? What happened to Moses' sin? Who paid for Moses' sin? And we understand Pharaoh. Pharaoh sinned and God condemned him to hell. Everlasting judgment why wasn't Moses condemned to everlasting judgment? Pharaoh's paying for his sin. Who paid for Moses' sin? It's a question. Abraham, he sinned. Isaac, he sinned. Daniel, Joseph, Jeremiah, all the people of God in the Old Testament who were received by God. The God who said the soul that sins must surely die. He's too pure to even look upon sin. How did that happen? Paul tells us. Those sins were overlooked for a time. Only for a time. The sins of Moses, of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jeremiah, all of God's people in the Old Testament. It's like God took those sins and He put them in escrow over here until the right time when He would send the sin bearer the Savior into the world. And when Jesus came into the world, He took all of those Old Testament saints and He put their sins on Jesus. And whenever He set Him forth to be a propitiation, He was paying for the sins of Moses and Abraham and everybody in the Old Testament who knew God savingly. And what was going on there? God was vindicated Himself. He didn't compromise His holiness. Pharaoh's paying for his sin. Jesus came in time to pay for Moses' sin. He remains just, as well as the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. And Paul says, and it's the same for us today too, because here's the reality. This holy God has said that when we sin, we are guilty, we are liable to the punishment of sin, which is everlasting damnation. So how in the world are we ever going to be made right with God when that charge is against us? You can't do it. We can't pay it. Our only hope is that somebody else will come and pay it. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He came and He stood in our place. He, he took the sins of all God's people upon Himself. And though we had not yet been born, we were on his heart, in his mind, because God had loved us with an everlasting love. 
And he bore our sins on Calvary. He endured God's wrath against us when God set him forth as a propitiation. Set him forth as the one who, bearing our sins, would take the punishment against our sins in his own body, in his death, so that as we look to him, we're justified. I wish I could explain it. It's incredible. He's just. He doesn't change. And now he's the justifier. The justifier of who? Of the one who has faith in Jesus. You want to be justified before God? You want to be accepted by God? This is, there's some of you here and you're thinking, yeah, and I'm doing my best. I'm trying. I'm trying. Quit trying. You can't do it. You can't pay for your sins. You can't be good enough for God. But there is one who has come who is good enough for God, who has paid for sin. Trust Him. God will justify you for Christ's sake. So believe the Lord Jesus Christ. How wise of God. To provide salvation for sinners in this way. Who could conceive of this way of salvation except the only wise God? There's some of you here that are not Christians, and we're so glad you're here. We want you to be here with us. But friend, I want to make sure you don't miss this. Do you see this? Somebody must pay for your sin. Your sin will be paid for. Either you will pay for it forever in hell. Or the infinite son of God who became a man and in the place of sinners went before God to endure God's wrath against sin for all who will trust in him has paid for your sin. And the only way that you can have your sin paid for through Christ is to trust Him. So trust Him. Believe Him. He's a Savior who came into the world for sinners like you, like me. And He will save anyone and everyone who bows to Him as Lord, confessing and renouncing sin, and says, Jesus Christ, save me. Save me. Look to Him to save you today. Believe Him. What a glorious salvation we have in Christ. What a glorious God we have who's provided such salvation to us in Christ. What an amazing privilege to be included in the mission of making this Savior known to the world. And what a kindness to be given gospel partners that we can link arms with as we do. Now to him who is able to strengthen you To the only wise God, be glory forevermore. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this incredible salvation. We thank you for your ability to strengthen us and for your wisdom in providing for us what we so desperately need. We thank you for the relationships that we have in Jesus Christ. We ask that you would come Help us, strengthen us. Lord, enable us to love you and to love one another more, more sincerely, more authentically. And have mercy on those who entered this room today, strangers to you, who've never had sin forgiven. Lord, open their eyes, draw them to Christ, give them new life, and show yourself to be the God who justly, justifies all who have faith in Jesus. For we pray in his name. Amen.